let the fun begin here. Okay. So I'm going to. Uh, we don't have a whole lot left to do, but we do have to shut it. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to finish up 3.2. This is going to take very little time, really. And then uh, we'll talk about the exam. I'll pass your homework back at the end of class today. Um, homework score is actually pretty good. Uh, I'm not sure if that's because more of you are leeching off of people that know what they're doing or if you're putting forth a little more effort or getting, getting the hang of this stuff. Um, hopefully it's the latter of, of those. Um, but uh, yeah, overall the, the scores are pretty good. I was pretty happy with your work um, on this homework. So I said I was pretty happy with your work on this homework overall. So very good. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's just finish this up and then we will talk about the exam. Um, and remember, of course, you should, you, you guys are all here, so you know this, of course. There's a exam on Thursday, so make sure that you're, you're here on, I know. Um, make sure that you're here on time um, so that you have um, the full period to, to get this done. Okay. So let's see where we're at here. Um, so we're just going to finish this up. Okay, so we were proving a proposition. Okay, so it's been a, a few days here, so let's just... Uh, remind ourselves what this was. And the proposition was that uh, the nth prime piece of n is less than or equal to 2 to the power 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of this again. Um, so let's just recall where we left off. Hopefully I remembered this. So I tried to convince you that uh, P sub n plus 1 was less than or equal to um, the product of the first n primes <coughs> and then plus 1. I think I stated that. Um, I don't know that I got too much further than this, but uh, you guys have this in your notes? Yeah, okay. All right, so this won't take too long. We'll, we'll be done here pretty soon. Um, so P sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to the product of the first n primes plus 1. And remember, we're using strong induction. I'm not going to write this down again, but strong induction. So we're assuming that this claim holds for P1, P2, P3, all the way down to Pn. Okay, so let me just write this down just to be clear. Um, so we know that P sub 1 is less than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the 1 minus 1, right? P sub 2 is less than or equal to 2 to the power 2 to the 2 minus 1. P sub 3 is less than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the 3 minus 1. And then, of course, keep going on down to P sub n is less than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1.
Okay, so let me put, I'll just put a little, uh, little box here to offset this. Okay, so from these two facts, we get Okay, so p sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to <clears throat> Okay, so notice we have we have this each one of these primes is less than or equal to one of these corresponding powers of 2 Okay, so what we can say then is that p sub n plus 1 then is less than or equal to this times this times this all the way down to this plus one right because each of these primes are less than or equal to the corresponding power of two on the other side so we can certainly do that right and so let me just write this out in a, a slightly better way so what is the first one simplified to well one minus one is zero two to the zero is one so this just becomes two right so we have p sub one is less than or equal to two to the first Right? What's p sub 2 less than or equal to? Well, this is just going to be 2 squared, right? And the next one is going to be 1. What is this power of 2 for 3? Right, so this is. Um, I'll write it this way though, so it's 2 squared, right? You guys see what I'm doing here? This is just 2 squared. Each of these primes are less than or equal to the, these corresponding powers of 2. And then we're going to just keep on going down. The last one being 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1. And then of course, don't forget, right, we still have this plus 1 at the end, so I'm, I still need that plus 1. Okay, well, what do we do when we have the same base and we multiply all of these guys together? What do we do with the exponents? Because I, I can rewrite this part as just 2 to a single power, right? You add, you add the exponents. You guys know that now, hopefully. So this is, it's going to look a little nasty, but 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared plus on down to 2 to the n minus 1 and then of course again we solve the plus 1 on the end okay and so I'm going to sort of offset this just so you can see where I'm going now I'm just going to put this in parentheses 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared plus on down to 2 to the n minus 1 is actually just equal to 2 to the n minus 1. This is, in case you're wondering, um, this is from, this is actually a problem that you did. This is number 2 from section 1.1. I'm not going to reprove this now, but um, you actually did a problem that, that dealt with coming up with nice closed formulas for the sums of powers. If you did, um, those of you that took Calc 2 probably with series, um, geometric series, maybe it's been a long time for you, but you may have seen this a while ago, that you can condense these things down. This is kind of how you, you, get, you, you find the limits of these geometric series. You do stuff like this. Okay. So, and if you, if you forgot this, that's okay, that's fine. But just accept that this, that's what this is equal to. So this becomes 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1. Okay. All I did is I just replaced this with what it's equal to here. I got that. Okay. Uh, do you buy this?
Do you believe that? It's a really long one. Sorry. But, um, well, what, what am I saying, really? I'm just saying that 1 is less than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1. That's all I'm saying. That's definitely true, right? What's the smallest this can be? n's a positive integer, right? What's the smallest this can be? 2. Right? Okay, so here, here, this is what I mean. I'm, I'm uh, not writing the parentheses like I was before. That's what I mean. Okay, so the power of two, both of these powers are two to the n minus one. Okay, and the minus one is not with the n up here. It's, it's outside. This. Okay, well, what is two to the two to the n minus one plus two to the two to the n minus one? It's Two times two to the two to the n minus one, right? There's two of them, right? We just multiply it by two. What do we do here? Do you guys agree that this two is the same thing as two to the first? Of course, you should agree with that. So, if I multiply these together, what does this become? Two to the two to the n, right? Because you add the exponents, and the 1 and the minus 1 will cancel out. And you get 2 to the 2 to the n. And would you agree this is equal to 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1, right? Okay. This, I didn't do any, this is a 1, I'm sorry. Um, this isn't anything complicated. n plus 1 minus 1 is n, so we certainly get the same thing that we got over here, right? Why did I write it this way? Think about this. This is the last part of the proof. We're done now. We're done. What is the inductive step? What do we actually have to show? I didn't write it down because of space here. But if we're trying to prove that p sub n is less than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1, and we assume it's true for all, everything up to n, well, what is the inductive step? We have to prove that p sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. And that's exactly what I have here. That's why I wrote it that way because that's exactly what we have to establish in the inductive step. Okay? So now you can see explicitly that we, we got exactly what we needed when we replaced the n with n plus 1. So this takes care of it now. Somebody have a question? Right. But what I'm, what I'm saying, though, is, is, and that's what I have... Um, that's what I have right right here, but what I'm doing is I'm 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 just carrying it farther so you can see explicitly that we actually have exactly what we need in the inductive step. Okay, the reason why I did this is just to show you that we can actually. I'm just I'm just carrying the proof through so I, I you know cover every little detail here. This is not I mean this is not technically really the end of the proof right because what you really have to show is that p sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. We don't quite have that yet. But once I do this now we've got it. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions here? Yes. Um, for coming up with a strategy for going um, Right here? Yeah. Uh huh. Would you say that sometimes you have to work backwards on your stretch paper to. Uh, you know yeah, yeah. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, you're basically wondering, well, how do you go for, how do you get from here to, to well, this how point? I do you know that you want to add that quantity? This here, yeah, okay. Here's, yeah, here's, here's, that's a good question. The answer is, you need to get, I mean, what we really want is we want to get p sub n plus 1 less than or equal to, like I said, 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1, which is the same thing as 2 to the 2 to the n. Right? That, that's where you, I mean, you know you need to get there, for sure. The, the inductive step is p sub n plus 1 less than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the n. Right? This is what we get when we replace n with n plus 1. And so what we've got right now is, is this. So what we need to do is make sure that this is less than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the n. And the way to do that is just to notice, oh, well, if we multiply this by 2, then we'll get 2 to the 2 to the n. So as long as this is less than or equal to that, then that's exactly what I end up with, is multiplying it by 2. Um, so basically what you want to do is, is you want to write an inequality that will allow you to end up with that at the very end. And the way to do it is just to notice that 1 is less than or equal to this. 
and then you get it to pop out at the very end. Um, that's not a totally satisfying answer, but that's that's really kind of sometimes you just have to sort of be a little bit clever, just kind of to mess with it a little bit until you kind of figure out what the right thing is. Yes. If you were if you were to do this yourself, then yeah, absolutely, absolutely for sure. I mean, a lot of proofs that are not so straightforward, you're not going to see exactly how to do it right away, and you're going to have to fiddle with it for a while. And then once you see how the pieces fit together, then you write the finished product down. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions here? Um, the test. Mm -hmm. Are you going to have to prove this on the test? No. Well, I totally agree that you have to be clever, but like, clever on a time limit is the... No. Okay. Well, um, yeah. I, I mean, I basically agree with, you, with what you're saying. I mean, yes. I don't know. Did you have a question? Or okay. No, I, 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 I do not, in general, think that my style is not to put really, really tricky problems. Like, for example, suppose I didn't do this. And I'm not going to have you prove this on the test, by the way. Suppose I hadn't done this before and I asked you to prove this would, uh, on an exam. Well, yeah, I think that would not be totally reasonable because there's a lot of tricks going into this. I wouldn't expect you to come up with this on the test. So. No, I wouldn't put something like this on the exam. Okay. That doesn't mean that there aren't going to be any proofs on the exam. But, and of course, how hard something is and how tricky something is, these are subjective things. But um, things that I think you should know how to do that aren't going to require a lot of work, yeah, I mean, those are, those are certainly fair game. Yeah. Any other questions about this? No? From the last test, yes, that's right. From all the problems, or specifically a definition or a? No, you should you should know how to do. Yeah, you should know how to do the problems. The solutions are all are, are all posted, for sure. Okay, so I'm not going to narrow it down any more than that. Just, but I'm going to tell you that yeah, one of them will will be directly from the test. Yeah. So no, so my point is, learn what you did wrong. Right? This is going to help you for the final exam. It really is going to help you on the final. You're going to see some problems on the final that you've seen before too. So this is going to keep you, you know, up to speed on this stuff. Yes. Yes. Um, as a class, did we do fairly poorly on the first exam? Uh, yes. <laughs> so is there a way that we're going to reconcile that? If we uh, the reconciling is that you have a big um, portion of your grade is homework. I think I'll be going to be honest with you. Here's here's part of the reason why the performance was so was, was as poor as it was. A lot of you guys are getting help from from other sources and are not actually understanding what you're doing. There's no doubt that that's happening. There's no question. So, in some sense, and I know some of you are going to get mad at me for saying this, the scores shouldn't have been as low as they were. That is definitely a huge function of why they were as low as they were. There's no doubt. Especially looking at the definitions. Most of you missed the definitions. That's bad. I mean, I, I wrote them down explicitly. Okay, and not necessarily missed all the points, but you missed a decent number of the points. My point is, you got to know how to do this stuff yourself. You really do. You, you have to. Okay. Um, or, I mean, were the scores horrendous? No, they weren't horrendous. I mean, most people passed the exam. Um, the scores were not as good on average as the homework. That's, and, and I think just seeing similarities between a lot of your homeworks, I can see that some of you are working in groups together, which is fine, but some of you are not quite catching on to what you're supposed to do on your own. And then when you go on the, to the exam and you have to do it on your own, you're, you're sort of tripping. And so, um, I mean, my answer to your question is I'm not going to change anything because I don't think I've done anything inappropriate here. Not at all. In fact, I think I've been very generous overall, especially with the amount of weight I'm giving on the homework. Okay, and the completion grades. I mean, I'm being very nice to you guys. I could, I could hammer you so much more if I wanted to. I'm, I'm just being honest. I could, and it would be reasonable. So you guys have got it actually pretty good. This is just a, a more difficult course. Okay. Yes. Well, I so here's the th okay. <laughs> yes, I have. Um, the problem is that there are basically almost no people available to do the SI, and the one person I know that's available, I think, is going to screw you up more than is going to help you. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. I'm not going to say who it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm being very serious. And of course, this is no work for me. I'm doing, I'm, uh, so my suggestion is, 
you know, if you're having trouble, come and talk to me. Email me. I, I told you in the beginning that I will, I will work with you. I'll set up appointment times to meet with you outside of my office hours. I am happy to help you out. You just have to take the initiative and say, hey, I need some help. That's all you have to do. And I, and I will help you. I am definitely more qualified by, <laughs> than any of these SI folks are, are to help you out. I, I assure you of that. Okay? You do not want someone who's never taken this course trying to explain proofs to you. I guarantee you do not want that. That's not going to help you. In fact, your homework scores are going to go down probably if you do that. Okay? I, I know I, you've got, you got to trust me a little bit here. I, I know what I'm doing here. I've, I have thought about these things. Okay? I'm not out to screw you guys. I'm out to help you, but you have to take advantage of it. You guys just have to take advantage of it. Okay? And some of you, a lot of you are. I get a lot of people come to my office and I'm giving you hints. I'm, you know, helping you. And everyone's welcome to come in. You know, I like you guys. I want you guys to do well. But you, you gotta, you gotta, you know, put forth the effort. That's all I'm saying. Okay. All right. We can we can talk more about this here in a second. I just want to finish this up, and then we can talk about the exam. Um, okay. This will take not much time at all. This tells you something about the distribution of primes. It's not very good, but it's okay. Okay, this is the last thing that we're going to do. Okay, so right, clear on this. The power of 2 is 2 to the n. That's the power on 2. Okay. Okay, so this is all there is to it. Let m be a natural number. It's basically one line. P1 is less than P2, which is less than P3, on down, which is less than P sub n plus 1. Okay, this, this doesn't require any proof. This is just comes from the ordering of the primes, right? P1 is the first prime, it's 2. P2 is the second prime, it's 3. P3 is, is 5. So there's, there's nothing to really say here. This just comes from just what P sub n means, right? Um, and what does the theorem say? P sub n plus 1 is, we just proved this, less than or equal to 2, that's a big 2, uh, to the 2 to the n. Okay. Um, I could, if you wrote the notes down, just see what, what I did at the very end, right? P sub n plus 1 was less than or equal to, we went all the way down at the very, very end was 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1, right? That was the last thing you should have in your notes before this corollary. But what's n plus 1 minus 1? It's n, right? So this just comes right from the, right from the end of Proposition 2, okay? So let me just write this down. Okay, so now, notice though that this doesn't quite prove the, the corollary, right? It, the corollary says that there are at least n plus 1 primes less than 2 to the 2 to the n. Well, I have n plus 1 primes here, but the last one I have less than or equal to. I need to rule out the possibility that it's actually equal, right? It's because if it were equal, then I'd only have n primes from this list that were strictly less than 2 to the 2 to the n. So I need to know that that piece of n plus 1 is actually less than it, not, not equal to 2 to the 2 to the n. Oh, Mersenne primes? Yeah. Um, oh, it looks, it, yeah, it looks sort of similar to this. Um, yeah, that's something that um, we'll probably get into later. It's not, it that doesn't... Oh, was he like with this? Yeah, I mean, so the, the point is that there's you can actually find some primes that are powers of 2 plus or minus 1. Right? Right. 
2 squared minus 1, 2 cubed minus 1, not 2 to the 4th, um, 2 to the 5th minus 1. So it's kind of this observation that, oh, wow, powers of 2 plus or minus 1 seem to generate a lot of primes. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I don't know if it, if it comes directly from this correlate. I don't really know what the history is exactly, but I, I'm guessing they're not really related. But this is something we'll probably get into later. Uh, the fourth minus 1 doesn't do it. 2 to the 4th plus 1 does. Right, right. 2 to the 5th minus 1 gives you the prime. Okay, so p sub n plus 1 is actually not equal to 2 to the 2 to the n. Why is that? Why is that? It's not a, really, it's not a very difficult um, reason, really. Think about what p sub n plus 1 is. Yes, that's all it is. Okay. Remember, these guys are all primes now. P sub n plus, it's a prime number. 2 to the 2 to the n is definitely not prime, right? No matter what n is. Okay, n's, n's positive, right? It's a positive integer. So, so 2 to the 2 to the n is, has 2 as a factor, but it's also bigger than 2. It's at least 4, right? So it can't be, can't be prime, okay? Uh, something I'll, I'm going to say, I'll, let me hold off on this. Um, let me just finish this first since p sub n plus 1 is prime, but 2 to the 2 to the n isn't, isn't prime. Okay. And that's all I'm going to say, really. I, I could say one final sentence to sort of tie all this together. But the point is, now since I know that p sub n plus 1 is actually less than 2 to the 2 to the n, now I've got n plus 1 primes that are all less than 2 to the 2 to the n, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So that's, that's it. Um, so what I want to do, two things I want to do with the rest of the time. I want to talk about things to study for the test, and then I want to give you some, some homework hints and maybe go back over a couple problems I didn't grade just to um, kind of give you an idea of, of how to go about doing those because the solutions aren't posted online. Um, okay, so again, as I said, the uh, exam is going to start with section 2.4. There's not a whole lot of stuff on this that's going to be covered on this test. Um, let me reiterate one more time. One of your, one question from the last exam will be on this test, so you should know how to do the problems on the last exam. That's something that you guys really sh ideally should be keeping up with anyways. When you get your exam back, you should be going over it and looking at the things that you missed. Um, some of these will be on the, on the final. Some of the, the questions on the final will be taken directly off the things that you've already done. Okay, so even more so probably than the, than the exams. So, so this gives you motivation to, to be prepared for the final. Okay, so 2.4, um, I'm just going to sort of say this. This is the Euclidean algorithm. Uh, I didn't actually do the Euclidean algorithm. Um, basically what we did, the new stuff in, in section 2.4 that we did was the least common multiple, right? You should definitely know what least common multiple is. If I could ask you that on the exam, what, what is given two non-zero integers a and b, what, define the least common multiple. What does that mean, right? Well, you mean, what do you mean? Do you mean actually find the least common multiple? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's possible, but I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I could say something like, here are two integers, what's the least common multiple? It's not going to be anything nasty like 1,050 and 2,145 or anything like that. Um, sure, it's possible I, that, that I could say something. It would be very basic. It would be something of this kind that you would have seen in sixth grade or something like that, you know. Um, so... What else? Um, and that's that's the main thing that you that you need to know. Um, as far as theorems are concerned, you should know. And I'm just so, so I can save time in here. I'm just going to say this, and you can write it down. Cause I assume you all have your book. You actually own the books, right? Or at least you have a copy. You should know theorem 2.8 on page 30. Theorem 2.8 on page 30. Again, I don't. There's no name for this, but I might say you know something like, um, you know. Uh, prove some basic property about the GCD or the LCM, you're free to use these things. So the reason why I'm saying you should know this, I'm not going to say, what is theorem 2.8 on page 30? That will not be, I won't say that on the test. But 
if you know it, it might help you with a proof, for example. Okay? So theorems that I've done in class you should definitely be familiar with is what I'm getting at here. Okay? And the corollary also on page 30, you should know that too. So there's just a theorem and a corollary. There's no ambiguity there. It's just that's, that's all there is on page 30. So you should know those things. Um, okay. And of course, and this goes without saying, you should be familiar with how to, how to work with these concepts. You know, I could, I could ask you to do a, you know, a problem or a proof that's relatively straightforward. You should be able to, to do those. So you should be comfortable with the homework as well, right? Okay, we skipped 2.5, 3.1. Okay, things you should know in 3.1. You should know the definition of a prime number. And I mean really the, the definition rigorously. There were some issues, you know, there were some issues on the first exam with definitions. So um, what, do, what do we need for an integer? I may say, you know, for example, I could say, what is it, uh, you know, let, let m be an integer. Define what it means for m to be prime. Well, there are several things you need. You, if you just say the only d divisors are one in itself, that's not right, because it could be one. The only, the only, sorry, the only positive divisors are one in itself, right? Um, well, one is not prime. The only positive divisor of one is trivially one in itself, right? But it's not prime. So you need to make sure that you get all of these little details right. An integer m is prime if and only if m is bigger than one, and the only positive divisors of m are one and m. That's exactly what it means to be prime. So don't leave out those details. Some of you are missing points because you're leaving these little details out. You can get this, guys. You guys can all do this. I am confident you can do it. Just make sure that you know it. There's not a lot of, there aren't a lot of definitions here. I, I would, ex and I will ask you definitions on the test. I would expect that you all get them, really. There's not a lot going on here. Um, composite. Well, <laughs> okay. That's pretty easy. That's the definition of composite is that m is bigger than 1 and it's not prime. That's the definition. That's all it is. Not prime. There was a, a lemma I proved about composite numbers. If, I don't know if you recall this. An integer m bigger than 1 is composite if and only if m equals r times s, where r and s are strictly between 1 and m, or, or integer strictly between 1 and m. I'm not going to ask you that. I'm going to say, what was lemma 2 on you know, February 27th? I'm not going to do that. Okay, But you might want to be familiar with it again, just because it might. What's that? Uh, no, that lemma was not in the book. Um, it's just something that I, I proved to enable us to prove the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, so, no, that wasn't in the book. Probably that's not going to come up on the exam. But anything that I've, I've, I've proven, you know, especially theorems, these are, these are things that are certainly fair game that you should know. Okay, um, so you should be familiar with... Um, Theorem 3.1 and the two corollaries on page 40. Theorem 3.1 and the two corollaries on page 40. This is, of course, this is stuff I've, I've done in, in the notes as well. On page 40. Okay, also, you should definitely know the statement of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. That was the main theorem of 3.1. I will definitely not ask you to prove it, okay? You do not have to prove this. That could take the entire time to do, and I'm not going to do that. I don't want to grade it either. So, um, but you should know what it says for sure. And it's not, um, it's not that bad. Now, now um, you can say it a couple of different ways. I phrased it slightly differently than the book did, and so you might say, oh, well, which one should I know, yours or the book? I don't, either one's fine. It doesn't matter. Okay, um, so the point is the fundamental theorem of, of arithmetic says that every integer bigger than one can be written uniquely as a product of primes, and the unique part just means up to the order of factors, right? Two times three and three times two, of course, are the same, give you the same thing. Um, another way of saying it, and this is what I did in class, which I think is a slightly more succinct way of putting it, every integer n bigger than one can be re, uh, written uniquely as a product of primes in canonical form. Then there's no ambiguity about what do I mean by order and all this stuff. Okay, so should you, um, well, let me say it this way. You should know what canonical form is too. If I say, you know, what does it mean for, for an integer bigger than one to be written as a product of primes in canonical form? Well, it means that um, you are collecting all the primes together. This is in your notes too, right? Where, where the primes increase in order, basically. That's the idea, right? P1 to the alpha 1 times P2 to the alpha 2 times P3 to the alpha 3, where P1 is less than P2, less than P3. Etc. 
on down. Is that clear? Is that, you guys okay with that? You, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay. Um, and then 3.2. Okay, so uh, this, you know, this, this sieve problem. Um, I may ask you, okay, here's something that I may do, okay? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to define the sieve of Eratosthenes because it's just a little bit bulky and awkward, and I, I'm not going to do that. Um, what I may do, though, is say something like this. I may give you, and don't worry, this is not going to be anything huge, okay? It's not going to be that big. In fact, it'll probably be relatively small, in fact. Um, but I may give you a number and say, okay, um, is this number prime? And it's, again, it's not going to be anything big. You would probably only have to check maybe four numbers or something like that. But what, what, what am I getting at here? Well, the, the oh, no, you don't have to do that. Um, I mean, so you could, well, you could. You could do that. Or you could use, remember, there's, there was a, a proposition I proved that said that if you have a composite number n, then it has a prime factor less than or equal to the square root of n. Right? So if you want to see if a number is prime, you just have to check the, the prime factors less than or equal to the square root of that number. And if none of them actually are, are factors, then you know it's prime. I may give you a composite number, though. So, you know, or I may not give you anything, but this is something that you should be aware of. So this sieve, right, you could do that. You could, you know, there, there are various things that you can do. Um, and if I give you a computational problem like that, I'm not going to get all picky with your work because you're not writing a proof. You're, you're just really trying to compute something and see if it's true or not. Okay, so I'm not going to get picky and say, oh, you didn't write this out rigorously or anything like that. You know, when I say a small number, I mean literally, it's not, it's not going to be something like 5,000 or something like that. I mean, I may give you, you know, I mean, it's not going to be this, but you know, I may give you, you know, 113 or something like that, right? So it shouldn't take you very long to go through, right? So, I mean, and you know, without a calculator, you know, the square root of 113 is somewhere between 10 and 11, right? You should know that. I mean, that should be something you can do without a calculator. So now you only have to check a few primes, and then you're done. Okay? Well, no, but I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be something that you really should be able to do without a calculator. So it's not going to be big, big numbers. Okay? All right. Um, and then you should know, you know, the theorem that I, that I, I proved for you. Um, so I, you know, I could ask something like in, in the corollary, I could say, okay, well, how you know there are at least how many primes less than or equal to two to the two to the n, for example, n plus one. Right? So you should be familiar with that. I could ask you something like that. Or I could say, you know, are there infinitely many primes? Are there finitely many primes? Right. Um, so. Um, I'll tell you, this is one thing. I'm not going to make you write down any proofs of any theorems from the text, okay? What I want you to do is know what they're saying. All right. Yeah, you should definitely know. That's, you already know this. You already know right now. If I said, are, are there infinitely many primes or finitely primes? All, all of you know the answer to this. You don't need to study this, right? Okay. So, and then aside from that, um, again, you should be, you know, you should be familiar with, um, you know, doing some some proofs because you're definitely going to have some proofs. That's all, of course that's the whole point of this course is writing proofs. So you're going to have to do a few of those. Um, okay. So what I want to do now, and then of course you're welcome to ask ask some questions too as we go through this. I would like to talk about a few problems, especially a couple from the homework that's due on Thursday that you might have questions about. Okay. So let's start with the most recent section. Let's start with section 3.2. Okay, so you had to do number three. And number three says, suppose that, um, well, let, me, let me make sure that I write it down the right way. And so this just says that given that P 
does not divide n for all primes p less than or equal to the cubed root of n show that uh, n is prime or the product of two primes. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wouldn't you have loved to have graded that? Like, you know, prime yeah, actually. Prime or not prime? Actually, yes, because I would have done it really quickly. I would have just gone like that, and it would be over. <laughs> okay, the hint says, assume to the contrary that n contains at least three prime factors. This hint is not that good. Um, I would actually advise you to ignore the hint, and I'm going to, I'm going to, do something I think is a little bit clearer than this. Um, if, if you say, well, okay, if it's not prime or the product of two primes, that does not mean that does not mean that it's a product of exactly three primes, right? It just means it's a product of more than two. Maybe it's 17 primes, and then you you just get all convoluted and confused very easily if you start worrying about that stuff. So really, I think the hint should have said this. The hint should have said, assume I'm going to write this down, but assume that n can be written as the product of three integers bigger than one. That's where you're going to get the contradiction. Okay, you can't write it as a product of three integers bigger than one. And then from once you know that, then it automatically has to be prime or the product of two primes. Because the product of more, then it's, then it's oh, okay. Let me just do this first. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, okay, so here's the idea. Okay, I'm not going to write out all the details. I'm, I'm going to leave this to you to write out some of the details. Um, suppose n bigger than 1 is an integer. You should start off the proof like this. And p does not divide n for all primes p less than or equal to the cubed root of n. Okay. This is sort of the analog, though. Of it. So if you remember this, this I proved this for you actually in class, that um, every composite number um, has a prime factor less than or equal to the square root of itself, right? This is kind of the analog of that, except now we're dealing with cubed root instead of square root. Um, here is the claim, and this is what I, I really suggest that you prove that uh, that you prove this. Sometimes I'll say in class, "Okay, well, here's one way you can go with the proof." It doesn't mean it's the only way. Okay, and some of you, of course, have not done that. You've done you've done the proof a different way, and that's fine. Okay, a lot of times there are three or four natural proofs of a, of a proposition. So you don't have to, in general, do what I'm suggesting as long as it's correct. This, I think, is the shortest way you can do this problem. I really think it is. So the claim is that um, P is not the, uh, let's see if I can finish this down here, not the product. of three integers, sorry, that's not what I meant, n is not the product of three integers greater than one. Okay, and what I mean is that all, all three integers are greater than one, that's what I mean when I say that. Okay. 
Okay, so what I'm what I'm saying, one good, uh, a nice strategy to prove to start the proof is to show that. Okay, so the assumption is that p does not divide n for all primes p less than or equal to the cube root of n. And what I'm claiming is that that implies that n cannot be written as a product of three integers, all of which are bigger than one. So I think you should start by proving that that n cannot be written as a product of three integers that are all greater than one. And I'll give you an idea as to how you go about this. Okay, can I go on to the next page here? Okay. Okay, so if you want to prove this claim, suppose by way of contradiction, that we can do this and can be written as a1 times a2 times a3 where a1, a2, a3 are natural numbers and they're all bigger than 1. Okay, so we can certainly assume that um, they're in increasing order, right? A1 is less than or equal to A2, and A2 is less than or equal to A3, right? Anytime, because multiplication is commutative, you can always just arrange them from smallest to biggest like this. Here's all I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to let you finish this yourself. Note, A1 times A1 times A1 is less than or equal to A1 times A2 times A3. Think about this for a second. This isn't all that complicated. You guys see how why this is true? A1 is the smallest of them, right? So A1 times A1 times A1 is certainly less than or equal to A1 times A2 times A3 because this is bigger than or equal to that, this is bigger than or equal to that. And the first ones are the same. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so, I mean, here's, uh, okay, so you really kind of want to go about it like this, and I'll tell you the reason why, um, because if you do your proof, then all you've really shown is that n, that n can't be written as a product of three primes, but maybe it can be written as a product of nine primes. You haven't pre completely precluded that. All you've done is shown that it can't be written as a product of three primes. So I'm not going to assume that they're prime, I'll, I'll, but that's a good question. I'm going to say more about that in just a second, okay? Okay, so if you go back to your notes, if you recall the, pr the proof that I did that if, uh, uh, n, um, if, if n is composite, then n has a prime factor less than or equal to the square root of n. If you go back to that proof, it's now at this point it finishes off very similarly to that. In fact, it's, it's really a, the same thing. It's just now you have three, you have a cube instead of a square. This is in your notes. You may not know what I'm talking about. If you look in your notes, you should be able to finish this proof. You just mimic exactly what I did at this point. Now, what I'm going to say is, well, and this I'm just going to say, this is up to you to write this down, but I would encourage you to pay attention to this. Um, well, why does that prove everything? Why does, why does then n have to be prime or the product of two primes? Why is that? Okay, and I really want you guys to listen to this. Okay, so what, after you finish this, you will, have, you will have shown that n cannot be written as the product of three integers that are all bigger than one. Okay, so what you're trying to prove in the end, though, is that n is prime or the product of two primes. Well, what if it was a product of more than two primes? Hang on a second. If it's a product of more than two primes, you can certainly group it into the product of three integers bigger than one. You see that? Suppose it's five primes. We'll just take the first one, the second one, and then all the, the, the product of the rest is your third one. You see what I'm saying? That's why this is the way to go, okay? Does that make sense? So now this sort of catches it. Now it catches everything now. Now you don't have to say, well, more than two could be three or five or 50 or 90. This takes care of all of it right away because you're not assuming that these are, are all primes now. Now you can get it for free at the very end. Okay? So the point is, this is the end of, the, of what I'm going to say. If you know a number can be written as a product of at least three primes, then it can certainly be written as a product of three integers that are all bigger than one. Okay? 
and you know you can't do that. So therefore, it has to be prime or the product of two primes. That's how you finish the proof. OK? OK. And again, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it. But this is just one way to do it that's pretty short and pretty succinct. OK. Any questions about this problem? No? So uh, I think for A, this is about the square root of P being irrational. Some of you maybe did this in discrete before. Um, I didn't talk about, about this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something about, about this now. OK, so first thing I'm going to tell you, you've, you've, if you took discrete, you all got this definition. You all knew this before this course, I'm, I'm sure. But let R be a real number. So now we're going outside of the integers for a second. And R is rational if... So what's the definition of rational? Me, tell me how to finish this, Joe. Right. Yes. If R equals P over Q for some. Right, right. Some integer P and Q not zero, right? Okay. I assume most of you have seen this before, probably in discrete or before that, maybe. Okay. So irrational, I'm not going to write this down, but of course a real number is irrational if it's not rational, right? And so the point is that the square root of if P is a prime, the square root of P is not rational. That's what you're trying to prove here, okay? There's really, there, here's the hint. Um, the book kind of goes through and, and proves the square root of 2 is irrational. Uh, of course, you can look up this stuff online, I and mean, this is very common, popular, well-known stuff, okay? But here's what I expect you, this, this, if you do the proof this way, I would expect that you would write this down in your argument somewhere. Okay, so the hint I'm going to give you is basically this. Um, hint, every rational number can be written in lowest terms. You should prove this okay does everybody know what I mean by this rational number lowest terms means that um, you can write it as a fraction every rational number can be expressed in a fraction where the GCD of the numerator and denominator is one that's what I mean right okay can you and you can prove this very easily using what we've already done in this course about uh, with the GCD Okay, and, and I'll give you a hint here, okay? I don't want you to make this really kind of informal and ad hoc and say, well, just factor out, factor out the, the, the stuff and you can do it and cancel it. You can make this very rigorous in about one line using things we've done in this, in this course. And here's, here's, what you're gonna, here's what you're gonna use, okay? Let D be the GCD of, we'll say P and Q. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not being completely formal now. I'm just giving you the, the ideas of the, the pieces here. OK, think about this. Tell me if you buy this. P over Q is equal to P over D divided by Q over D. You guys buy that? Multiply through by D. You get P over Q, right? And there's a theorem that we talked about in class. Maybe you've forgotten this, and that's okay if you did. But if D is the GCD, we're using P and Q instead of A and B. But if D is the GCD of, of P and Q, then the GCD of P over D and Q over D is 1. If you divide through by the GCD, the GCD is 1. Okay? So now you know that this rational number can be expressed as a fraction where these, the numerator and denominator are relatively prime. Okay? So you see, you can do it now, just quoting what we've already done in, in one line. And then, um, 
So let me just say this first. What's that? Oh, I'm just, I'm just telling you two, two, two facts. I'm just saying that, one, that whatever our given fraction is can be certainly be written in this way. They're the same thing. And the second is that, in fact, these guys are relatively prime, which is exactly what it is that we're trying to establish, is that every rational number can be written as a fraction where the numerator and denominator are relatively prime. Yes? Um, so are you saying that you would rather us do it this way instead of, say, like, Oh no no! As long as your as long as your proof there is definitely more than one way to do this. As long as your proof is correct and just uses um, things that we've done in class, it doesn't go outside of what, the scope of what we've done. Then it's fine. So no, I'm not saying that you have to do it this way. I'm just saying that this is one way you can do it. Okay. And then once you've got this, have you guys seen this? The proof that square root of two is irrational. You probably, you've had to have seen that in discrete math at some point. Yeah, so it's the same idea here, okay? One way you can proceed here, and this is, I'm not going to say anything else other than this, is to say, by contradiction, assume the square root of p is rational. And so then by this, you can say the square root of p is a over b, or p over q, where a and b are relatively prime. If you square both sides you'll, and, and you use some facts from class, you can get a contradiction. Your contradiction will be that, in fact, a and b are not relatively prime. Your contradiction will be that p divides a and p divides b. That's the contradiction. Then you're done. Okay? It's very similar to one of the standard proofs that the square root of 2 is irrational. But again, there is more than one proof of this. So you can, I'm not saying you have to do it this way, but that's one way to do it. Yeah? Can you say that P divides a thing that you just said again? Okay. So the, here's the way you proceed. Here's one way to proceed with the proof. Just one way. It's to say, okay, suppose the square root of P was rational. It's not, but suppose it was. Then you'd have the square, I'm just going to jot this down, but down here, just, okay. If it were rational, then you can say the square root of p is equal to, say, a over b, where a and b are relatively prime, right? Okay, that's how you would start. Then what can you do? Okay, I'll just, I'll just say this. If you square both sides, you get this, right? I expect your proof to not look like this. I'm just giving you the details, okay? And then if you shuffle all the algebra over, then you get p b squared equals a squared, right? And I'm not going to go any farther than this, but now if you, there's one theorem that actually you, we did in 3.1, section 3.1, that will allow you to conclude something. Well, you know p divides a squared now, right? Then you can extract even more information from that because p is prime. That's all I'm going to say. And then, then it... <coughs> So, but, so you said that p divides a squared, right? Yes. And then p divides b squared? Well, that's ultimately where you're going to want to go, yes. And then that ends up being a contradiction? Well, you have to do something a little bit more than this. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop here because I've already given you a, I, If I say anything else, I'm going to give the whole thing away. I, I don't want to do that. Okay? So think about it. Think about it. Okay? You've got you to gotta do this. I mean, you've got to work on it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna finish the proof. If I if I answer anything else, I'm gonna give the whole thing away, and I don't want to do that. Okay. All right. So um, I also wanted to talk about something that um, I'm gonna pass your homework back here in a little bit, but I, I'm gonna say something about. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys a question here. Um, do you guys have this written down now? Three. Three. What about three? Oh, okay. Uh, no, it's I, actually three is involved. In, that's weird. Actually, three does come up in this question. Okay, so here's my question. Suppose that x is an integer and three divides x. Natural, natural number, yeah. Sorry, natural number. And 3 divides x um, is 
just this is all you know. Okay, so the question is, do you, is, is X composite? No. <laughs> if X is three, it is not composite. Okay. A lot of you, and I'm going to pass the homework back in a minute. There was this problem um, where. Uh, Let's see. Ba basically, you you. I think it was p of prime bigger than or equal to five. Show that p squared plus two is composite. I think that was the the problem. A lot of you just said all oh, three divides it, so it's composite. No, that's not necessarily the case. Okay. Um, be really careful about this. Just because a prime number divides something does not make that thing composite, because it could be the prime itself. Okay. In order to know that a number is composite. Three, di you know, three dividing x doesn't necessarily make x composite. It does if x is bigger than three, then it makes x composite because then it has a factor other than one in itself, right? Three sandwiched in between one and x. That's what makes it composite. Okay, but just because something bigger than one divides a number does not make it composite by itself. You need to say something else. You need to say that it's actually bigger than that number, for example. Then you get composite. I saw a lot of this on the homework, a lot of this. A lot, and I think you, you guys know this, but again, you're writing proofs, so you need to make this rigorous. 3 dividing x does not imply x is composite. Counterexample, x equals 3. Right? Okay? You might say I'm being overly pedantic here, but that, that's the whole point of writing a proof, is that you, 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 you establish everything completely rigorously. So some of you are going to see that you have some points taken off on this problem um, for that reason. Okay? If you noticed... Okay, so this, this I'm just going to say, um, I, I'm not going to write the problem number down, but the problem was P is bigger than or equal to 5. Show that P squared plus 2 is composite. Okay, now, there was a hint that said that, you know, hint P has to have the form 6K plus 1 or 6K plus 5. You remember this? This was the hint. Uh, remember, I've said this a lot before, so you guys have to know that um, this is fair. I've told you, and you'll, you'll remember this now, right? Have to prove hints. I've always told you that. Some of you didn't do that. You lost a few points for that. No, no, no. I've said you always have to prove hints. You guys, you guys know I've said that. I've always been saying that. You can use previous stuff, but you have to prove the hints. Now. If, yes, 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 exactly. There have been a couple of hints that you said, don't bother proving that. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Uh, if, I, if I have not told you that you don't have to do it, then you do have to do it. Okay? Well, okay. I'm not going to write all of this again out in detail, but but this is important, okay? Um, because of time, I'm, I, I don't have time to write all of the k's and the integer, blah 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 blah. But okay, some of you said, well, p, you you sort of cross these out right away. Because you say, well, these are not, these aren't primes. Because, well, for example, here we can factor out a two, we can factor out a three, we can factor out a two. But the point, the pro but you never use the fact. Most of you, in fact, maybe all of, well, not all of you, some of you did this. You didn't ever use the fact that p is bigger than or equal to five. That does play a role in this somewhere, right? Okay. Um, because, for example, two, two squared plus two is, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so. 3 squared plus 2 is not composite, right? So somehow to, to do this proof correctly, you have to use that fact in your proof somewhere, that p is bigger than or equal to 5. Most of you did not. It never came up. Because some of you might say, well, this, this is, you can factor out a 3, so this, this uh, is never prime. No. If k is 0, it is prime. You see that? Some of you are missing this, okay? If k is 0, this is prime. So a lot of you are missing that, those steps in the proof. Okay, so be very, very careful when you're doing this to think about it and say, ah, oh, just because you can pull something out does not mean that, that that thing is not prime. It does not mean that. Okay, so I wanted to address this too. Um, 
Let's see, I have time for, anybody have any, any questions they want to ask? You have a gun. A gun? <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I do not have a gun. <laughs> Who's the gun for? Him. Uh, <laughs> okay. You, I, I, okay, I, I do have to say that, especially given your comment. Guys, this is a proof class. It requires some thought. I'm not a big bad meanie. Some of you think that I am. I'm not. This class is hard. It's a hard class, okay? I hope you didn't say that, that you wanted the gun to shoot me, because I'm, I'm actually one of the better instructors for this course. I, I assure you of that. If you don't think it, you're wrong. I'm sorry. It's true. Yes. So I can rewrite that as 3 times 2k plus 1. Yes. Because it's 3 times m. Uh -huh. In that form, and we have to be greater than 5, therefore that. Yes. That's form yes. Right. Because and then, yeah, because you can pull out a three. Since three divides, so if p is of this form, you can pull out a three. Three divides p, and p is bigger than or equal to five. Then p is a, then three is a factor that's not one and not p. So therefore, it wouldn't be prime, and that's how you rule it out. Okay. So okay, any other real questions here? <laughs> I don't know. I wish I did. Um, I don't know. Of course, if, if I tell you it doesn't matter, it's not going to affect your, 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 your studying strategy, right? I mean, no. having, having the knowledge is, I mean, you, there will be proofs on the exam. It will probably be comparable to what we did before. I'm trying to figure out if we could expect the problem that's going to be from the last test to be a proof or to be a definition. I'm not going to say. Ah, uh, I see. Okay, I got gotcha. you. You said we have to figure things out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, so well, I'm not. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say. Yes. Other than like the definitions and theorems that you specifically said earlier mm -hmm. to know, mm -hmm. um, will will we need to know any of the other ones? Like we from the, from before? You mean? Of, like from this. Not okay. I know. I mean, everything that I would ask you should come from what, what I told you before. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything that's not going to be on the test? Yes. <laughs> but if I told you everything that's not going to be on the test, then I would have. Uh, then you could infer exactly what is going to be on the test, and I'm not going to do that. I'm a little. I'm not dumb. Okay. No, 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 that's not. I know. I know that. I know that. I know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding about that. You, I know you're trying. I, I appreciate that. Um, I know what you're saying. You're saying, is there anything I can just say that specifically that's not going to be on the exam? Well, yes. I mean, you're not going to have to write proofs of theorems from the text, for example. That's not going to be on the exam. Um, you know, other than that, um, you know, the, the statements of theorems, the definitions, and then, you know, homework problems that are, you know, not among the most difficult ones, um, that the proofs are not extraordinarily long. These are things that, you know. Uh, maybe, but but possibly not. Okay, um, but it should be it should be something that works out fairly quickly from things that you've done before. And if you go back to the solutions of the of the first exam, that's more or less the case. I mean, even the induction problem kind of worked itself out as long as you know how to do induction. You know, and the other proofs were really pretty short, so it's going to be stuff like like that. Can we expect induction on this test as well? Um, yeah. Induction. Well, I mean, so again, there was an induction yeah. problem on the first. Exam. Um, this test, aside, let me let me put it this way: aside from possibly the problem, the induction problem on the first test, you shouldn't see induction on this exam. Okay. So know how to do that first induction problem. Okay. I I I, I decided. Yeah, I'll give you that. Okay. Okay. Well, let me go ahead and pass your homework back then. Don't forget your next assignment is due. Don't forget to bring it with you, right, on Thursday. Okay. 3.2. 3.2. Yes.
Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, just send it to me as soon as you. No, I mean, I just got it. I just got the report. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Okay. That's that's fine. Just. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I, it's just basically it's just up to you to keep to remember to to get it done. You know. Okay. Let me uh, let me turn this off here.